we have the executive director of OpenStreetMap US, Ariel, who uh, I'll, I'll actually let you all introduce yourself. I'm not sure what you do as a job. Yeah, I'm a software engineer, but in my free time, I help work on OpenStreetMap, and I'm local to Brooklyn. Hey, I'm Z. I am the lab manager of AOIC, and I guess we're giving our locality. I'm in Flushing, Queens. And I'm Guillaume. I'm the chairperson of the International Inter OpenStreetMap Foundation, and I moved to Greenpoint this summer, just across the river. Came up from Richmond, Virginia, in case anybody cares. <laughs> so I came all the way from the south. <laughs> How many hours of train? Oh, too many. So I'll start with a very general question. What is OpenStreetMap? I can start, and then maybe we can all go down the line. This is one of my favorite questions to ask. OpenStreetMap is a collaborative project, crowdsource project, to create a free, editable world map. That's it. Anyone in the world can add data and anyone in the world can use the data. It was created in 2004 in the UK was where it started. And at the time, the Crown had a copyright on all even tax funded and government funded data that had been created. So this was a response to needing open data. So somebody started have, hiring couriers to drive around the city and upload those tracks to the internet. And that's where it started. But I think by now it's grown way beyond the founders' wildest dreams. Another fun fact I'd like to share is in 2010, the Ordnance Survey made their data open through open data as well. So it pushed that along, I think. And today there's millions of contributors all over the world. And what would you like? Yeah, I think it's really like our map. Like it's any, anyone's map. It's what you add to it. You can use it for free. and It grows based on the community. Yeah, I like advertising OSM Street OpenStreetMap as the Wikipedia Maps, as Noel says it, because, yeah, anybody can go in and add it, but you can also extract data if you want. So I'm a big GIS nerd. I love pulling map layers from city sources, but OSM is so much better with the streets, but also with its cultural sites and also, like, buildings that don't necessarily are updated as often in, in city data sets. So the resource is a GIS database for me. To complete that myself, maybe, it's... Um a database as well as a map. You're seeing a rendering of the map, but all the data behind it is accessible and not all of it is shown on the map. But as you've said, the Crown, uh, the British Crown now publishes its data. Uh, we have very good open data here in NYC. So why would anyone want to be using OpenStreetMap and not public open data? Or why not Google Maps? Maggie, you want to take this one? This is a common question. And I answer it differently, I think, every time when someone asks me about this. But think about if you use Google Maps, you're using it probably most likely to route yourself somewhere. So you're interested in points of interest, and you're going where that map tells you. You have real no, no real agency. It's like going to a conference and getting a hand at a box lunch. <laughs> you don't really know what's going to be in your sandwich. But if you're going to compare maps to sandwiches, OpenStreetMap, you get to go into the deli and tell them all the layers you want. And once it's there, you can take it back out again. So if, if you want to map all the trees in Brooklyn, you can. And then if you want to take that data back out of it and make them just your own, rend like your own tree map, you can use it again. So the data is not going to any proprietary so source. It belongs to you when you put it in. So if you want to have a database of geospatial data, you'd use OpenStreetMap. But if you want to map yourself to the nearest coffee shop, you could also use OpenStreetMap, what something like Google is more suitable and built for. Thank you. Can you go to the next slide? Sure. I think the next slide is a perfect example of what OSM can accomplish. This is us right now here. So this is so much more details about what like what the specific buildings are called that might not be in Google, the individual trees that might not be available for you to extract from Google, and then all the various paths that you can walk as a pedestrian. There's also some metadata in these paths where there's some labels or, or, or tags, we call them in OSM, where you can tell folks who are in their wheelchair, can you get up this ramp or can you get up the staircase and a lot more smaller metadata. There's like some symbols here. You can add art installation, some people micro map areas. So you can add like low grass areas. So it looks a lot more beautiful, but in, in all OSM is so much more context that you can pull and use in your own data. I also would say one more thing is many parts of the world here in the US, we have very rich geospatial data and open data, but many parts of the world aren't mapped at all. And there's not a commercial interest in mapping them, and a lot of larger mapping companies probably will never map there. So OpenStreetMap is the only option for any reliable geospatial data in places, up, especially outside the United States. Although much of the United States isn't mapped. Is OpenStreetMap quicker to update in your experience in New York City? I think it just depends on the layer and the investment that the city puts into that. So one example we have is when the Brooklyn Bridge bike lane opened, we were like fighting over who would 
updated first. I think it was updated right after someone wrote across it in the like opening ceremony ride. There's also a big ecosystem of tools around OpenStreetMap data. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so if you want to extract OpenStreetMap uh, data, you can use Overpass API, or if you use QGIS, open source version of GIS software, there's a couple of plugins like Quick OSM where you can just plug in, I want all the streets, um, all, all the residential streets in my neighborhood, and you can import that into OSM, buffer it, do whatever you want with it, and then, yeah, just attribute OSM in the end, and yeah, you can use that data. The borders of OSM don't end at city borders, and sometimes our analysis does. If you're studying the housing crisis, it's important to think too about well. Nassau County and Westchester County. There are buildings there. If you have the city data set, you just that area is gray on your map. I have a screen up behind us. That this is a series of tags that were created to respond within the map to COVID-19. So starting to tag buildings as open or closed or COVID hours. And this was this was developed in a matter of hours by a group of volunteers to be able to start updating their business. I, mean, I worked on it in Baltimore when I was living there, but all over the world, these tags are in. On businesses and having them tagged this way allows it to chain what if there's no more COVID hours you can remove the tag and it's easy to find throughout the database so that's I would say another big difference of being able to respond very quickly to, to change in the world rather than waiting for someone else to change it for you you can go in and create something like that. so the tagging is completely open and it's there's there's tagging guidelines the community is very it's global but there are ways that we communicate with each other and work together to create tags and there's a voting system and yeah, um, I've never been involved in that. Someone else has. <laughs> One of you, too. I guess you can think of like local differences. What is it protected by clan in New York City versus Amsterdam? There's still the same tag and the same, I guess, like way of converting values and options. Yeah, it, like intended for a global audience. So OSM also includes like a <coughs> Wikipedia like reference guide where you can see what is the most like accurate tag to like tag your like surface. If you're dealing with, oh, this road is bumpy or unpaved, you can reference that so there can be a standard. So if you're looking at like hiking paths that are paved versus hiking paths that are not paved in New York City, you can study that because there's a standard somewhat. So even <coughs> if OpenStreetMap uses open data, integrates it, it then gets enriched, <laughs> augmented. Yeah. I do you like the next slide? This comes from, I was reading Harper's Magazine, and they have the Harper's Index where they give you a bunch of facts and figures. It was like, um, of the like 60 statues in Central Park, only four of, or of women, and at the time, zero were non-fictional women. So now there's a statue of the suffragettes, but each of the statues in Central Park has a Wikipedia page, because claimed enough to have a Wikipedia. So you can link Wikipedia pages with features on OpenStreetMap and go a little deeper and look at other attributes that the, and put together a map like this, which will work in an area that has data already added to OpenStreetMap. Who maps in OpenStreetMap? Is it all GIS professionals, architects, urban planners? Yeah, yeah. I think everyone can map in OpenStreetMap. I'm trained in geography in GIS, but at, at Beta NYC, we're trying to have folks learn OSM. Maggie's doing a ton more work in, on that, so she can talk more about that. But at Beta NYC, we're trying to have folks in New York City more embrace like citizen map, citizen mapping and also uh, crowdsource mapping on OSM because a lot of the resources on on the open data portal might not be as up to date. Again, it might not even exist. Like the statues data set, I wouldn't imagine there would be like a parks data set on it. There might be like news articles on it, and then as New York City community members, we can add onto that map fairly easily. I think OSM has so many guides and resources, and also it's just a quick, I think, edit button and then. I'll show you a tutorial of how to just start adding points, lines, and polygons. I think we're going to host more classes on OSM. I read a description once that OSM is the map created by people like you, which I really like. Maggie, do you want to talk about about who uses OSM and oh, really who doesn't use OSM? Because sure. you see it being used more and more. Yeah, sorry, I keep going back and forth between the slides. We put these together. We can't. It's going to trying to go to the relevant ones, but. There's a lot of users and there's a lot of data contributors. And I think there's a good line to draw between the two. For a long time, the project started in 2004. I think the big focus was getting data onto the map, right? Making sure things appear on the map. And now, at least for OpenStreetMap US, I'm really looking at how to get more users and more people doing interesting things and, and things that have helped to bring positive change to our communities with the data that's in OpenStreetMaps. There's a list of companies that are, and organizations and journals and cities here that are using OpenStreetMap data, but also contributing to it. So I think there's more of a two-way street now that 
people who are using it for their base map are also trying to improve it where they are, where they see discrepancies. One local example was when OpenStreet, when the OpenStreet started, it was Lyft that added the data to all the New York ones. We were adding some, like the one I live next to, they needed to know which streets were actually closed and reached out to us. Is it okay? For this? By, by we, there's unofficial communication channels, but there isn't, like, I am not a person that owns New York, but, like, <laughs> just checking. So you say community, so how is it organized? How does the other people have project work? It's organized across many different things in a way that you may even just call not organized. There's a Slack, there's a mailing list, there's Wikipedia pages. We keep OpenStreetMap Wikipedia pages, which looks the same as Wikipedia, but it's OpenStreetMap specific. There's also the OpenStreetMap Foundation, which Wikipedia <laughs> is the chair. They make the search sure those servers are running. They're actually physical servers where the data lives. And uh, there's a seven member volunteer board, and there's working groups within the global community. One that I sit on is the local chapters and communities working group. So OpenStreetMap US is a local chapter of OpenStreetMap Foundation local meaning national, but so we are a 501c3 nonprofit and our mission really is to supporting OpenStreetMap projects here in the U.S. There's local chapters all over the world and that working group brings together leaders from all those other local chapters so we can support each other's efforts and collaborate globally on the project. There's other working groups like the data working group where if there's any issues or yeah. So then this nonprofit was started by five volunteer board members in 2010. And one of the things that organizes the community is also the State of the Map Conference. So there's a global State of the Map Conference to bring together users and contributors and all in the same room, educators, and figure out how we can, can better collaborate. And then each of the local chapters usually has their own State of the Map. So ours is State of the Map US. I don't want to go on a two of a tangent, but so yeah, that's general organization. But for really, it's a global ecosystem that, that works well because it isn't tightly governed. Yeah, and then OSM is also organized by folks with specific interests. So, and I are part of like the bike slash pedestrian mobility OSM like, folks that gather together and map stuff, but there are also folks who specifically map parks and the assets in parks. So you, they can study the equity of parks. I think two slides before this, so there's also people who like really specifically map certain like streets and their names and their assets. So there's a lot of various stuff that people, groups that are interested of mapping, consolidate all their data in OSM and that kind of benefits the whole entire community as a whole. We, we previously did a sidewalk mapping project that mapped the whole entire community, District 7 in Flushing, Queens. And that kind of really helped improve the ways that we study how folks are connected through our streets. Because in OSM, you can tag a lot of elements. We can tag mark crossings. We can tag curb ramps that are accessible and have tactile bumps. We can really figure out like where which areas are less accessible by wheelchair or mothers with strollers or like any kind of unpaired mobility. There's a lot of various projects and groups and communities adding data to OSM. I saw interesting examples of, of people adding data to OSM for a specific project, but adding, they were at, it was in Germany, people adding, making sure all the schools were in open street mapping, making sure all the maximum speeds were there around the schools and then producing a map of where the speed limit was too high close to schools. So it, it's kind of circling that way, self-feeding, but just so. Yeah, and again, uh, to repeat Maggie's point before, like a lot of the communities that, that are not in the United States or in the global north, um, in, in the global south, there, there is just a lack of mapping in general. And there just needs to be communities that have buildings built, buildings in OSM and in address points. They can get local aid or local municipalities can figure out what's going on in their areas. And also disaster relief, which is a hot, which is a large part of OSM uh, called Hot OSM, I think. Yeah. Humanitarian Open Street Map Team is an organization that exists to support mapping in vulnerable areas. But there's mapping for resiliency happening all over the world as well, and in the U.S. through different. This is uh, this was an example of what I call like a sad bus stop because you can't really get to it without walking into the street, even though there are curb ramps on each side that lead to patches of dirt. It's not really accessible, but it has all the pictures of an accessible bus stop with curb ramps and whatnot. But those lines on the right are all the paths, and I tag them as, you know, this is a dirt. If you were to do like network analysis, measure, can you get to this path with these certain conditions, you find that you can't, even though in a different data set, this might say it's accessible. Yeah, we were chatting before the sessions, what do you want to talk about? And you were telling me about how the DOT here has cycle paths shown on their map but when you go on the ground you find out it's a bit of paint on the top if at all 
yeah, I, things we struggle with is also like frequency. Um, so if a road gets repaved, but the bike lane wasn't drawn. Sometimes here that could mean like months if it was repaved in the fall and then they don't paint until spring, which means like the bike lane doesn't really exist, even though it'll still be in the city data set. And you were, you were, we've talked a lot about individual mappers contributing. And Maggie, you touched on companies, organizations that, that contribute themselves, like Lyft. But one thing we see starting to see in Europe is public bodies like the German Federal Cartography Agency starting to contribute themselves, saying, hey, this is where the eyeballs are, this is where the users are, and this is where we get QA for free. Are you starting to see something like that in the US? Yes. So I, I don't have it on here as a slide, but one of the things that started happening through OpenStreetMap US is I, I became executive director two years ago, and before that, we didn't have any paid staff. So it was difficult to get programming going. But over the last two years, started getting together a government working group with representatives from different U.S. federal agencies, so DOT, USGS, MPS, AFRA, all the alphabet soup. <laughs> but we're meeting once a month and talking about how to better integrate OpenStreetMap into their workflows. So how OpenStreetMap data can augment our federal data sets and not only fill in gaps that the federal data sets have, but how that can help to fix things in OpenStreetMap as well. So how those two data sets can better work together. And that's resulted in an initiative called Public Domain Map. So it allows for mapping using public domain imagery, public domain data sets, and mapping over top of those and finding those places. Our pilot's going to be mapping railroad tunnels in Colorado. Very specific, but looking at the FRA da data compared to what's an open street map, and then allowing the FRA to use that data from OpenStreetMap editors to update their own database. And it also goes back into OpenStreetMap as well. So I think it's the quality of OpenStreetMap is getting so high that it is really becoming a complement to a lot of our government data sets. And we haven't really had a lot of conversations with state or local government agencies yet, but we hope to once this pilot project has gone off the ground. And if anybody in this room is in, is works in government and they're interested in that conversation, please find me. Yeah, in many places you find out that People are surprised that there's this OpenStreetMap project and wh where did you get all this data and who gave you permission to map this and uh, and sometimes more more up to date than even the, uh, the data they're working on and it's their job that someone else did that on a three o'clock in the morning. It's quite funny when you have those conversations. Do you, how can how can people get involved? Do you have specific programs? You mentioned T2SM. You also said you can just go to the website, click edit. There's going to be a guide. What can you tell? Us? Take over this panel now. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. This has a few programs. Teach OSM, any educators in the room, we help connect educators to OpenStreetMap to use it to help teach geospatial thinking and kind of an on-ramp to tech. So we educate educators in bringing OpenStreetMap into different kinds of curriculum. We also have curriculum available for people to use straight from our website. So if you're teaching about economics, we have a course about how to use OpenStreetMap in that history. We have a way to integrate OpenStreetMap into that lesson. So that's Teach OSM, and that's really bringing in a different group of mapper and kind of mapper. So we're getting into high schools and community colleges and, and colleges. There's also another program not run by OpenStreetMap US called Youth Mappers that's through universities. So university students getting together to form clubs at, at universities. You may have heard of it. Uh, plug another program that we just started. This one has a little story to it, but I know we're running out of time. Um, I was in an event like this, Tugis, in, in Baltimore for a, a geospatial conference, and I was talking about OpenStreetMap, and someone came up to me afterwards, and they said, I work for advocates for children and youth, and we want to know where there's a lack of playgrounds and if there's any un underserved communities we need to advocate to have a playground in their area. Could we do that in OpenStreetMap? And I was like, ooh, yes, we can. And there just happened to be a group of people there also from the mapping community in Baltimore. So we set up a, a mapathon, as we call them, to map all the playgrounds in Baltimore for this agency, for this nonprofit. And that led to this national nonprofit, Kaboom, reaching out and saying, hey, we can build these playgrounds. And we started this program, Mapping for Impact, because it was clear that there's a disconnect and there's a lot of nonprofits and organizations out there that could use data to support their own missions and their advocacy. So how can we connect with those nonprofits and find partnerships to map for those needs? So we've now been mapping with Kaboom all around the world, all around the country to fill those gaps. So we, we mapped in Philadelphia. We're now mapping in Colorado to map playgrounds there and find those underserved communities and support their mission of play equity. 
Uh, so that's a really exciting project. And I do have one that we're launching today for Brooklyn. So we're supporting a local New York nonprofit called Rising Tide Effect. And they just began their work a couple years ago to reduce social inequity and bring positive, positive change to these underserved communities through the aquatic experience, which when I first heard of this, I was like, tell me more. I didn't realize that drowning was one of the leading causes of accidental death in children. You know, wrong. And that 80% of children from low-income families don't have any access to, to learning how to swim. So this nonprofit reached out and said, can you map the swimming pools in New York? <laughs> we, can, we can get help in doing that. So today we just set up this task and asking people to map the swimming pools in their communities. And this nonprofit's going to work with the Department of Education in the city of New York to find places that could potentially fit to start teaching aquatic skills in their neighborhoods. So it's an exciting partnership. I don't know if Kate's here, but if she is. So this is a new program, and it's finding new ways to, to use the data to support other people's missions. So if you have a partnership out there, I have a lot of asks today, but <laughs> let us know. So this is programs mapathon that kind of event. Can you tell us about what it's like to map outside of those structures? Uh, like Ariel mentioned, you can just sign up and start editing. Can you describe what that's like? Yeah, normally when I want to start mapping, I want to just look at my local area, see what's interesting, what's not mapped, what, what can be interesting. Sometimes it's businesses that I want to showcase. Hey, there's a ton of bakeries in my neighborhood and I can walk there in 10 minutes or something like that. And I want to do a study on that. You would essentially go to openstreetmap.org. And from there, you can sign up for an account. And then on the side, on the main page, you zoom to your location. You can click edit. You can see what assets are already mapped and start mapping. There's a ton of guides online on Google. Uh, Teach OSM has a ton of guides too. And a whole wide range of community um, out outlets. So our Slack, I think, is the most responsive. But we have a newsletter that, can talk, that, that talks about the various things other folks are mapping. I think if we go to the previous slide, yes, sometimes you just get a like really large interest about certain assets and you can start mapping it. You want to talk about this? Yeah. People got interested one day in, in playground maps, which are maps drawn on the ground. It's meta map maps inside of a map. But um, for some reason, the New York City playground contractor made these like everywhere. And people that lived somewhere else wanted me to go look at them because they weren't on the satellite imagery yet. So I had spent like a Saturday biking around. I forget where, but there's one that like someone painted that's like a map of the Caribbean cool to be able to know how many of those exist in the city where they are. So I just want to mention another tool that is like a gateway into OpenStreetMap. Street Complete is a mobile app that asks you like the Google map style questions where it's, is there a wheelchair? Things like that. It's just something to stress if you've never used OpenStreetMap is just how much you can add to a single feature. Like when we say pools, it's not just the pool where it is. The opening hours, the website, how many cubic meters of water does the pool hold? How many lanes? Temperature, who's the operator? Yeah, <laughs> the temperature of the operator. It's as much data as you want. Names of places in other languages. Like typically only look at maps in English because that's my main language, but you can add the other names of places and then create maps for people that aren't in English. That's a fun thing. And then we have two of three events coming up. I think we have a Rackathon, which we are going to walk around lower Manhattan and you're going to be using paper maps and you can draw on those paper maps. And from there, field papers, the platform we're using will allow us to import those maps into OSM. So it's a really easy way to get into OSM. So that's help happening, I think, this Monday, 1 to 5. And then Maggie's doing two events throughout Open Data Week 2. You want to learn how to edit, to contribute and take data out of there. There'll be two virtual trainings, one on Tuesday and one on Wednesday, different times, and everyone's welcome. It's free. Last question. What's your favorite use of OpenStreetMap? Find my way to state of the map US. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find a way to plug everything I can. We are having our annual conference in a couple of weeks. If you find yourself in the Tucson area, please join us. And I have these discount cards if you want to come for cheaper. My favorite use of OpenStreetMap. Actually, I really like to use it when I travel. I like to, like, even today. Yesterday I was out exploring the city. Like I said, I'm from Richmond. And I like to add where I go out to eat if there's not enough information. So I tend to map points of interest. And then I remember the city I'm in or the place I'm in a little bit more because I'm adding details to it as I explore it. Uh, I was also going to say as a travel companion, I, I run say, Strava and Gaia, and they're both powered by OpenStreetMap. When I'm in a new place, I want to make sure I'm not like crossing a highway. or something. I like crossing in unconventional means. If there's a half street, the five and a half street, like I want to know like when that path is open or specific community gardens or like some hiking trails in the city that are not conventional, you go through someone's backyard, but that 
a lot is still public. I love doing that. And then these small, there are a few community gardens by highways where you can go in sometimes and you can explore like nature in an urban space. Yeah. And yeah, there was a recent presentation today, I think, about the steward map, the steward map. So I might look in that and add some features and explore these areas. Yeah. Before we go to q and is there anything more that you three want to say? Let's Maggie. say if you get started and if you, ha- how many people have mapped an open street map in this room? Nice. All right. How many people want to try it? Groovy. Okay, great. <laughs> so I would just say, don't be afraid to, you're not going to break it. And if you do, someone will let you know. <laughs> but don't be afraid to just go in there and search for your where you went to middle school and see if it's on the map. And start with something really local that you know a lot about and make that first edit. And there's a lot of places to ask questions. When you make that first edit, you're going to get a box that pops up with all this information about like joining a local community or finding an answer to your question. Think that OpenStreetMap does it pretty well. It's bringing on new mapper. That's my thing. I'll end with it. Don't be afraid to try it out. Uh, I'd just say if you have any questions, I'm in the Beta NYC Slack. I'd be happy to help you solve a problem with OpenStreetMap. One question earlier, so one of the speakers mentioned, a panelist mentioned that uh, the UK Ordnance Survey map has been made open. As, was that uh, imported into OSM or were they orthogonal? So it's been partially opened and what has been opened does get used for OpenStreetMap. It's difficult when you've started mapping in one direction and someone else comes with a another data set to, to mix those two together. And uh, so a lot of the conflation tends to get by hand. But yeah, everywhere across the world, when an open data set appears, you'll have someone who's bored and wanting to do a street map stuff looking at, can we import that? Would it make sense? So all the UK data is in it? A lot of it. Okay. Oh, yeah, that was my question was about like governance. So if there's conflicting changes, if does this all get resolved into a single canonical version of the world? Or what if somebody wants to like fork off a version that they're encoding with some different assumptions? Like, how does all that get settled? So I love using uh, like historical data and OSM has a forked offshoot of, uh, it's called historical OSM and you can tell like dates, start and end dates of a certain things. So that's one way of doing it. But for borders, it's much more complex and there's a whole entire, OSM. it's a whole thing. And as anyone paying attention to the news, this week and I think it sometimes gets controversial. We use something called the on the ground. If you go there and people tell you, oh, you're in Kosovo, it's a country in the Balkans, then this is what OpenStreetMap is going to reflect. So it's Maggie also gets sometimes calls from angry rangers saying, hey, the, the path you have on your map, but we don't want people to take it and delete. And our answer is usually if it exists on the ground, it's going to be on the map. Hikers are not the only users of this. Maybe firefighters want to know those trails. And we can map the access restrictions on. But yeah, if it's verifiable on the ground, you can map it. It's usually the thing. And pretty, not this is why I packed my car this morning. Uh, has to be pretty permanent and not tiny. And you can map it. There's also tools that exist to recognize if there's a data or feature already in the map. And if someone's trying to put a new one in, there's tools coming out to reduce that duplication. Who pays for OSM and how is OSM funded? The OSM Foundation has about 2,000 members who pay 15 British pounds of a membership. We also have corporate members who pay more, significantly more sometimes, and donations. It's still a pretty lean organization. A lot of it is volunteers who pay in their free time to do the work, to keep the servers running. We're just in the process of actually hiring someone for the first time to be running the servers and make sure the lights stay on. It was all volunteers until. I'm Thad Krosky, uh, based in Boston. And I was wondering if you all had heard of the AB Street Project, which is a transportation planning and traffic simulation software, piece of software for creating city friend- cities friendlier to walking, biking, and public transit, which has 7,000 stars on GitHub and is coming out of Open Democracy and Open Seattle in the same community parallel in Seattle as opposed to New York City. So just curious if that has landed. I, I hadn't heard of it from the OSM side, but it is all using all of OSM data and I guess it's active in more cities besides just Seattle. Thank you. Yeah, I told Dustin he was crazy before he put it on GitHub because he wanted to build a OpenStreetMap render in Rust. Or people were like even really using Rust. I'm glad he didn't listen to me and went forward and did it. But it, yeah, that's a great example of using OpenStreetMap. Power your own tools because wouldn't have been able to create the map data himself too. 
and do all that other work to create a transportation planning tool. It's also very emancipating to have tools like that. As someone who's been in, in city commissions where the planners were telling us it's impossible, if you do this, you're going to get infinite traffic jams and the sky's going to fall down. I want to try that. I want to run the simulation myself. I want to check. Uh, hey, so I just wanted to say a huge fan of OSM. I've been using it in some capacity for projects since like college and high school. But I actually kind of had a question. I Y'all mentioned just the peer-reviewed nature of OSM earlier. And I think we've all read about how Wikipedia handles things like vandalism. And I was wondering if that's how y'all handle it or if it even is an issue in the OpenStreetMap. Very common question, especially for a crowdsourced project. It's like, how can you trust this? How do I trust this data? I think this is handled in a different ways, depending on what the issue might be. I think for if someone who tries to redraw an entire country, it's going to be very easy to find that, to change that. A lot of smaller things come up. And, and I would say at this point in the OpenStreetMap evolution, most people want to build it instead of tear it down, which is really great to see. People still make mistakes. And it's not necessarily vandalism. And a lot of those mistakes are caught from local mappers who we call it like map gardening, keeping an eye on their community on the map. Was it Linus Torvald? With many eyes, all bugs are shallow. Go with that. And, and there is, for, for bigger disputes, there's a, a group of volunteers called the data working groups, kind of the janitors of OpenStreetMap, who deal with like, larger vandalism and things like that. But in general, it's a lot easier to fix the map than to break it. Vandalism is a small problem, and you don't see this on this site, but the proof is in the pudding. The, the quality of the map is visible to anyone who uses it. It gets used by pretty much everyone. Even Google uses it in Poland for bus routes. So it's a problem that exists on a tiny scale. It's something the community spends a lot of time thinking about and fixing. Just think there is a naughty words list, but even that list of corporate contributors, they have their own teams combing the map for people using swear words on the map or something too. So there's a lot of people keeping an eye on the street map. I have a question about the geocoding. So I played with Nominatim in the past, but one thing I'm looking for is, I don't know, maybe you can tell me, can you do like temporal geocoding? Like I want to know this place like five years ago, what was the, what was this called? 10 years ago. Is that is there such a thing? Yeah. So we, we, you talked a little bit about this, but and I think in the popular press, like about a year ish ago, it got really big. Like OSM is the basis for all these like big corporations and governments. And you talked about it a little bit, but is there a movement towards governments like adopting OSM as their de facto standard? Or is it more just going to be that, like what you were describing with the FRA, like they share data back and forth and they maintain their own? data sets? Like, are they going to just use OSM as a standard or just share back and forth? Also, there's a great Python tool called OSMNX. If you're familiar with Python for accessing OSM data, it is a godsend. Check it out. Okay. I'll do the first one first, and then we can go to the second. But, uh, openhistoricalmap.org is a project. Is OpenStreetMap US has a charter project program now, and they're a part of that. And that's their goal is to make the most out-of-date map in the world. <laughs> so <laughs> they're doing a lot of work now. And we're partnering with them to do just that. What did New York look like in the 1700s? And then you can time slide it. So they're always looking for people to help map the past. And there's a lot of tools out there to do that. And it's open source. It's just like OpenStreetMap, but you map the past. So that's a place where you could do that and build the history of how the city developed. Really cool. Um, there's also, if you care about the recent past, there's the overpass API that's been mentioned. It's, it's a way of accessing uh OpenStreetMap data is a bit like SQL, but even less read. And so you can tell it, give me the data like it was five years. The second question was, is there a move for governments to use OpenStreetMap? And I do see that more, not yet in the US, but I see it in middle-income countries in Kosovo before. And the community there made such a good map and the commercial actors didn't care. There wasn't enough advertising to sell. So now the, for the census, the surveyors walk around with a map of open, uh, the tourist maps for the capital are made with open. Um, I also see it for niche usage, uh, bus maps or bus routing, government use. And the, the German government is contributing themselves to open street map to make sure. In the US, we're starting a group through our government working group talking about hiking trails. So there's been a group that formed between app companies, national parks, land managers, and open street mappers to talk about how we change that tagging schema such that it aligns with what the land managers are seeing on the ground, how the national park system works, and how it's rendered in Strava or all trails or outside. So 
that's what's more happening. It's like, how do we create a data schema that aligns and works with both sides so that we are keeping an eye on that? I think I mean, this is the last place where OpenStreetMap, I think, will be going. But, but even like Guillaume said, oh, so Uganda uses OpenStreetMap as its map. And even is it Denmark who uses it to map their addresses and keep track? There's a good virtuous circle in Denmark. Yeah, when they notice changes in OpenStreetMap in the addresses and the official address keeping body investigates when there's Do you want to say anything? Talk about New York City. But, I was yeah. gonna say I think we're at, like we're getting the we're getting the hook. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, yeah, come and come and talk to us. We can talk about <laughs> OpenStreetMap until we're blue in the face. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>